and welcome to another episode of Boss News and Public Relations, where we talk about everything business and PR. I am your host, Samantha McCoy. I am the CEO of Mission Key Communications, and we equip entrepreneurs and leaders to increase their visibility through media exposure. Hi, my name is Brooke Waller, the CEO of Brooke Bowl Media, and I help small business owners with their brand content and public relations. And I am Stephanie Cottle, and I am the CEO of Black Girl Group, and we are a freelance staffing agency that connects African-American women freelance creatives to companies seeking to outsource more diverse talent, and I am also a freelance publicist. Excellent. Well, welcome, ladies. Thank you all for joining me again on this episode. I'm super excited. And if you all did not miss, did not watch our first episode, definitely check that out. It was a lot of fun. Such a great conversation. What did we talk about on our first episode? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> Brands. We were, yeah, we t- oh, we talked about corporations and if they really care about Black Lives Matter. So you definitely want to check that one out. It was, it was a great time. So, and if you missed the scoop on Lecrae and things that he said or didn't say, we talked about that too. So it was a great, um, great convo. So today's topic, we are talking about the future of PR. So just now with everything that has been happening this year, this has been a whirlwind of a year and pretty much every industry has been impacted by it one way or another with the pandemic, the global pandemic, COVID-19. And now we are also in the midst of a, really a social justice revolution, I would say, as we are focusing on um, Black lives and um, the lives of people of color, equal rights, equal justice for everyone. And um, has, it has really just brought a lot of things to the surface, um, especially for corporations. And um, so really what that's meant for, for public relations is that, you know, really everyone is a crisis manager at this point. <laughs> if you're in public relations and you have never handled a crisis or managed a crisis before, this crisis was pretty much handed to you. And now we are all having to have those, uh, those crisis communic- that crisis communications arsenal um, that we are you know, de- building and developing, whether it's for our own businesses, whether it's for um, the companies that we're working for. So just wanted to talk to, um, to you ladies about that. So um, Stephanie, if you wanna kick us off, what are some things that you have seen as far as you know, just PR changing, even just in the last couple of months? Yeah, so one thing that I'll definitely say has, that has changed significantly in our industry is that now is not the time for you to be able to push all products or all things that your clients are doing. I think it's super important for us to recognize that maybe now is not the time for you to be in the media spotlight. And I feel like you have to be very careful and make sure that you're treading the line right now. So if you're not talking about, you know, social and racial injustices, if you're not talking about the coronavirus, if you're not talking about things that are currently impacting the landscape of this country, also elections, um, if you're not talking about those things right now, then unfortunately, now is not a good time for you to gain media traction. And I know many clients hate to hear that because they're thinking, well, I have a new book that's coming out or I have a new product that I'm selling and I need to release it now. And maybe just now is not the right time because right now, more than anything, timing is of the essence. Brooke, what do you think about that? I think that's so true that we really have to be strategic um, of what our client, um, what is their goal. And we also have to be strategic of what's in the news, what's trending right now and kind of pivot. I feel like as um, public relations um, professionals that right now that we are learning how to pivot in different ways, learning new skill sets, um, learning new strategies of how we can use to still get our client in the news. Yeah, definitely. I really like what you said, Brooke, because I think that it's really about making expectations realistic because, you know, Stephanie, like you said, it's not necessarily a time 
to be in the spotlight, but I would say in certain outlets because every media outlet has different a different target audience and a different agenda. And so there may be some platforms that still want to hear what's going on. They kind of want to provide an alternative to all the news. Because you know when you turn on the local news, the national news, you're going to be hit with, you know, the latest and greatest of everything going on with COVID, everything going on with Trump, everything going on with, you know, X, Y, Z, fill in here, fill in the crisis here. So, but there are media outlets that are serving as an alternative to that. And for people who still want to hear about, you know, the great things that are going on, positive news, encouraging messages, or, you know, even just what different businesses and business owners are doing. So I think that it is really important to just really be honest and realistic about how choosing the media outlets and being strategic and saying, okay, if you are choosing to move forward with your launch or with your book or with, you know, whatever it is, you know, what, which outlets would be most receptive to this and how could we pivot and maybe you won't be on this outlet, but this outlet may be a better fit. So I think it's, it's more of what I try to do with my clients is really encourage them to think kind of outside of the box and think global, not globally, but more broadly about what media coverage really means. Because, you know, PR and, and but building buzz, you can build your own buzz. You know, and so it's really about if you can't be on a certain channel or a certain outlet, it doesn't mean that it's over for you. It's just saying, okay, what are some other creative ways that you can use to build your own hype, so to speak? And then when it is a good time for a particular media outlet, you're, you're doing both. So it's not all one or all the other, but both are working together to to help increase the exposure that you're looking for. That's so, so true. Um, I was going to say that we have to constantly um, build relationships because I feel like even though during um, these, these kind of rough times, the pandemic that we are in, still checking with people, still checking with your contacts and build that relationship because you never know when they might have a lead um, for you or your clients. Exactly. And, you know, even to piggyback off of that, Brooke, I, I think that's the part that people forget about is like when you're building a relationship, building a relationship takes time and it's also, you know, two-sided. So even as a publicist, yes, we want our clients to gain coverage, but you also have to remember that we also want our friends who the journalists to keep their job. And I think one thing, I don't know if I said on the last podcast or not, but I know right now, you know, just checking in with my friends who are journalists, a lot of them have said like, hey, Stephanie, our news offices have cut, you know, maybe 50% of our staff, whether that's written or whether that's, you know, TV news. And the challenge is now they want to know what covering your story is going to do for them because they need to keep their jobs too. And so when you have that relationship, you understand that as a publicist, it's like, hey, I do have this great client, but I also have this friend who's a journalist who needs to keep their job. And if they both can't benefit from the, the piece that you're pitching, then again, maybe it is like Samantha said, thinking much more broadly, um, or maybe just saying, you know what, I think this story would be great, but maybe we should revisit it again in maybe like two or three months when things have kind of slowed down a little bit um, in terms of the news cycle. Yeah, and Stephanie, I think the points that you're making, they're really valid regardless of what season that the news cycle is in, because especially I think now that we have really shifted so heavy to digital, that a lot of media outlets, before it was more about viewing and how many people are watching, now it's really how many people are clicking and how many people are viewing and how long they're viewing. Are they watching the whole thing? Are they sharing it? Are they reposting it? So it's so many other factors that go into not only is this story newsworthy, but is it clickable you know what I mean? like is it shareable is it social media worthy really and that is I know that there are a lot of media outlets who their metrics have changed and shifted over the last five to ten years because of the digital pieces and so even thinking about that where before you could kind of pitch 
stories based on a client's maybe credibility based on their education or maybe because they have some you know new methodology or system or something like that that they came up with now in addition to that media outlets are also looking at what is your digital footprint you know are people following you do pe have people deemed you a an authority that they know like and trust and so the media is kind of expecting you to do some initial work you know what i mean where it's like you can't just show up and say hey media i'm great now you know show me to all these people <laughs> you know now it's like that you have all of these free platforms that you can use to create and show trust and show your authority show that you can speak on camera you know there's, there's just so many other factors where i think that those things even when we're not in the type of crisis situation that we are now i think that those rules um stephanie and guidelines that you were saying they still apply because it's it's not about the media is not there for you the media is there to serve the audience and their target audience and and they want to be able to present um you know information that is beneficial so i know i'm kind of like on a soapbox on this because i'm very passionate about this topic <laughs> but i just think i have to explain it so much because people are very you know i mean everybody says that they love media attention but then when you think about all of the factors and the prep and the different things that go into it it takes a little bit more it's not as easy as just picking up the phone and calling and even people that we do have you know in our in our networks and in our contacts we can't just email them just because we have them in our email you know what i mean <laughs> like we have to make sure that it's something that is relevant that is that works for them so and you know, Samantha, I'm I'm very passionate about it too. And and one thing that I do recommend to other PR professionals, because Brooke mentioned, you know, pivoting, is that I think it's really important now more than ever as PR professionals that we do start um, gaining more knowledge in SEO, um, because you know that search engine optimization, those metrics are what really help you with you with your pitching. So like even whenever I'm pitching, you know, especially like very large platforms, then I'll say, you know. This is a story that I'm pitching right now. This topic alone is gaining X amount of searches in Google. And so if you do cover this story, you'll be number one in news and then you'll have the opportunity to get this many impressions. And so going back to what you said, Samantha, it plays into the whole aspect of, yes, I'm a publicist, but I also understand your need for digital click because yeah. I've already done the research for you. So now you don't have to worry about if this story works. I'm telling you that this story is going to work. And I think as PR professionals, the more information we can give the journalists that shows them, hey, this story will work for you, I think the better your chances are of landing those placements. That's a great tip. Definitely a great tip. And I, I think the more that we can show the work that we've done and how prepared we are, that does that makes the journalist job much easier. So as far as I guess what you see different pub publicists having to plan for and and kind of deal with now that's different than before we were talking about always having to have crisis management plans in place and if you have not worked in crisis before you kind of are getting thrown into the deep end of it so where's the good place um either brooke or stephanie you can answer first where, where would be a good place that you think people should start when you're talking about building a crisis management plan? You know, first of all, you need to do your research. Um, who's going to be on your crisis communication um, team? Um, plan for different scenarios um, that could come into play. Already have your, your crisis statements. Um, what you would say, have you have yourself a crisis go book so everyone has everyone's contact information um, and just, you know, be prepared. Um, I remember that I did a crisis scenario and make sure you have hard drives and um, digital copies as well. That's really good. So I guess even specific companies and organizations are reopening 
And what do you think, you know, communications and PR teams really need to be prepared for from that standpoint? Like even just making the decision to reopen and then what precautions need to be in place if a company or an organization is planning to, to reopen? I think it's really important if you are going to reopen, I think your first point of communication needs to be explaining why you're choosing to reopen because I think that there could be pushback in that area. I think up next, you wanna make sure that you have, like Brooke said, you have that crisis communication go-to plan. So if someone in your company tests positive, if your CEO tests positive, if an outside vendor tests positive, if someone dies from the coronavirus, having those talking points readily available in the form of social media communications, e-news blasts, press releases, um, and list goes on of, of a way that you can communicate your message. And I also think it's really important that if you your company is reopening or you're the CEO of your company, make sure that you have one go-to spokesperson. Because if you don't have, you know, if you have multiple people who can make statements, then things can get, get really misconstrued um, with multiple different people talking. So make sure you have one voice um, moving forward it, whenever you have them talking to the media, if you are going to talk to the media. Um, and I think, you know, we, we talked about this a little bit earlier before we hopped on today, it, that it's about, you know, expecting the best but preparing for the worst. And, you know, I'll even give an example um, of a gym here in our area. Um, our gyms are not allowed to be open yet. Um, and where, where are you, Steph? I'm in North Carolina. So in the state of North Carolina, gyms are not allowed to be open. Like, we're still in phase two. Um, and so our gyms have been closed since the beginning of the pandemic. Well, um, several gyms in our area have found um, a clause um, within the, the show, well, no, we're safer at home, within the order basically saying that if you have a doctor's note, you can open up your gym. Well, a gym here in my area has decided to open up, but they're saying we don't require you to have a doctor's note because we don't want to um, invade on HIPAA um, privacy laws. And so someone actually reported them to the health department for not taking medical notes. And so the health department shut them down. And then they were forced to send out crisis communications to say like, hey, uh, we had to shut down because we're now under investigation. Well, had they kind of planned that out beforehand, then it wouldn't have been such a, a nightmare for them to handle um, once they were shut down. Because even in their communication, you could clearly tell they hadn't prepared for it because they, they disclosed way too many personal information. Like they told who reported um, them to the health department, which I think is probably not in a good thing for you to do right now. Um, it just doesn't look good brand wise. But again, I think it's super important for you to literally, like Brooke said, plan out scenarios that could possibly happen and then have a solution, a plan to attack if those things happen and just hope that they don't. That's really good. That's really, really good. So yeah, it's, it seems like now with crisis planning, I mean, we've really been in crisis mode for several months now, and it's really just a matter of having to add to the crisis plan that you have so that you are ahead of whatever is coming out next. So thinking in advance, your company or your organization might not be opening in the next month, but at some point it's going to reopen. So even though you may not have that date yet, or you might know it, not know what that is, you can still put those crisis pieces in place so that you're not scrambling once you find out, oh, we're about to open in two weeks and, you know, we haven't done anything to prepare. So I think just having that forward thinking strategic mindset as much as you can will really help you to avoid that, that last minute scramble. So what do you all think about how clients really should be even positioning themselves right now? Like, how would you advise them to be positioning themselves? And what I mean by that is we talked about how now most major media outlets are really looking for people who can speak to the hot button issues that are prevalent right now. So do you think that it is, I guess, I guess I'm curious to know what things do you think are 
strategic ways to kind of insert yourself into the news cycle and then what things are kind of a stretch or reaching and how do you know which one is which? Okay, I'll start. <laughs> um, okay, look, I, I can just give some examples. Okay. That's the best, the easiest way for me to do it. So for example, I have this client who, um, they're called the HBCU Hub, and they provide resources to high school students who are interested in attending HBCUs. Um, they also um, provide information to HBCU students about local events that are taking place. Well, obviously right now, you know, the kids are not in school. Um, they, are, they will be returning soon. But one way I was able to insert my client into the news cycle was through thought leadership. And so now he speaks about what reopening plans look like for HBCUs and how HBCUs can make sure that they're being better advocates for their students as they reopen. Um, I also have another client who is a travel agency. They were really trying to figure out, okay, no one's traveling right now, so how can I insert myself into um, the news cycle? And so what we discovered during the July 4th holiday was that RV travel is on a rise. And so again, positioning her as thought leadership, so she was able to talk about why folks are tr choosing to travel via RV versus traveling via plane. And while it may not be ideal because most clients want those feature stories, it really works out in the client's favor if they know how to drive the conversation back to their brand. So, you know, if you have, I don't know, let's say if you have a, 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 your teacher, you have a teaching app, right? Well, the students may not be in school yet, but maybe you insert, you know, yourself into the narrative talking about how your, your teaching app could help, you know, students stay better engaged. Um, when school does reopen and then you say and by the way if you want to download it you know here's my website you know what I mean so I think it's really important that you don't get so caught up in the fact that hey this story is not not about me it's not look at me look at me but you're really offering your thought leadership but then at the same time you're still making sure that people know that you're the CEO of this company or you're doing this right now um, and that you're always driving traffic back to your brand and back to your website really good definitely a good, a good point. I was going to um, add to that um, also as the driving back people back to your website is to always look to try to add value. Um, I advise my clients to always do that, that it's not always about look at me like it's seven to look at me, look what I can do, but how are you adding value to the conversation um, such as there's still such a conversation about going about race and social injustice and um, I have a client now working on to how she can insert her um, expertise and from a psychological um, background and um, just from her background of dealing with um, crisis and scandals how she can insert herself um, into the conversation by adding value but then um, also inserting her brand and her services that she offers. That's really good. And even on that note, I think I made a point earlier about that there will be some media outlets that are open to, you know, still learning about what different businesses are doing and, and business owners and may give you kind of more of that feature or profile type of interview, even in the times that we're in now. But I think even with that, something important to note is that I always advise people to have something prepared to that is related to what's going on right now. Even if that's not what you're brought on, like maybe you're doing a podcast or maybe you're doing, you know, a love segment or a relationship segment or something like that. But still, no matter what the interview subject matter is, always being prepared to speak to what's going on in the world because people, you know, a lot of times hosts will use that as an icebreaker or someone may call in if you're on a radio show, someone may call in and just ask about it. You know, there might be some way where there's always gonna be some opportunity to tie it in. So I think that it's very important when you are prepping clients for interviews that you're always saying, 
you know, what do you think about this? What are your thoughts on this? And if someone was to put a microphone in front of you unexpectedly and ask for a statement, what would you say? Just so that you have those words formulated and you're not kind of in the moment kind of searching and trying to figure it out. And I think even if, if you're someone who says, I'm not a political person, I really don't speak to, you know, I'm, that's not really something that I'm heavily focused on. Well, even if that is your stance, you still want to even be able to say that articulately so that people, you know, just so you have something ready in case you need it. What are your thoughts on how celebrity publicity has been going on recently? We know there have been the past few months, definitely a lot of, of things going on in Hollywood. And I have not had a celebrity client, at least not yet. But um, how do you see the, the future of PR even kind of fleshing out on the Hollywood scene? Do you think things have changed for them? And just kind of what do you see that look like? And I guess the reason I'm asking is because people do have different thoughts on whether celebrities should be chiming in on everything that's going on right now, especially if they haven't before. So just wanted to get some thoughts on, on what you think about that. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, a, it's an interesting topic to say the least. Um, I, I'm kind of torn, right? So it, it's almost as if, you know, the, the conversation we're having about branch timing in. I think if you don't say anything, people are going to have an issue. If you say something and you say the wrong thing, people are going to have the issue. So it's almost a situation that you're darn if you do, darn if you don't. Um, but I do think it's important that you do play that fine line. So even if you don't know the best thing to say, just say a little something or just give a little retweet or just share something, you know what I mean? Just to show like, hey, I do hear this. I do know what's going on. I am staying involved. Um, because I do believe that there, there, there is a generation of consumers who do depend on their favorite artists or their favorite celebrity responding. Now, our generation, we might not care you know, what Mariah Carey has to say about what's happening in the world. And I love Mariah Carey, by the way. Um, but, you know, there, but, you know, on the flip side, you know, you know, another generation of kids, they might care about what ASAP Rocky has to say about the coronavirus or about racial injustices. So I think, you know, every artist and every celebrity, they just have to really know who their audience is. And I'm really interested to see how things do change for celebrity PR. Um, I have had celebrity clients in the past, but what I will say is that the world of entertainment PR for many years has been very segregated. Um, and oftentimes, a lot of these black celebrities, they don't, they don't use black publicists. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes they'll say, well, we don't know where the good black publicists are. And it's like, no, that's not true. There are lots of them, including us, you know? And so I think now a lot of those black celebrities they're now having the fire put under them. People are calling them out. Like, I, I won't name who the celebrity is, but there is a celebrity who recently made a statement about how, you know, so how Hollywood needs to give more opportunities to Black people. Someone called him out and said, but you don't have a Black publicist. You don't have a Black lawyer. Um, you don't have a Black accountant. So, like, how can you demand more from Hollywood when you don't even do anything for your own people? And I thought it was really harsh, but at the same time, I think we have to have those tough conversations. Now, I'm not saying that as a celebrity, you have to use a Black publicist, you have to use a Black lawyer, a Black accountant. It's your choice. Like, it's America. You have the freedom to use whoever you want. But I do think that if you are going to make these strong racial justice stands right now in this climate about how we need to be invited to certain tables, then we have to make sure that we're inviting our own to the table, too, and we're not becoming these gatekeepers that lock us out of opportunity just because we enjoy being the only ones in the room. Wow. Well said, well said. Brooke, you have any additional additional things to add to that? I think um, I agree with what everything um, Stephanie said, and I feel um, it comes back to relationships and building relationships and referrals. Because a lot of, as Stephanie said, they're saying that they don't know where the Black publics are. Well, we are here and we are out there. Um, and I was reading an article and the article is saying um, they um, feel for people that don't have a community of where they are right now. 
in this um, hard time if they're working in a place where they don't have a community because I feel, um, as you are fellow Black publicists, that we are a community and we help share resources, um, give referrals, and I just feel um, that as a Black community, we have to continue to um, uplift others. And I agree with Stephanie said, like, we're not here to judge. Well, you don't have a, you, you have the right to choose, you know, this is the service that they're providing you, you're paying your money, you have the right to choose who you want to represent them. But I do have an opinion <laughs> of, for, for the culture, for the culture is, I'm black and I'm going to have um, someone that's not black represent me or say a statement out in, out um, to the media, but they, they don't have any cultural background of where I came from or what even some of my songs mean to the culture or for my community. How can they, you know, really speak, uh, really speak on that or provide a statement or guidance? for that when they themselves don't, you know, they don't know or have a clue um, for that. But um, that's what I have to say. <laughs> no, that's, I think that's a great point is, is knowing that the people who are on your team, because that's really what a publicist is, is someone who is on your team and knowing that whatever their cultural background is, you want to have someone on your team, especially if they are someone who you're paying to speak on your behalf or write on your behalf. You want to have someone who understands what your brand is about and what you are about as a whole person and really being able to have someone who can, when they do have to give statements on your behalf, do something that is authentic to you so that you're not appearing disconnected because you said, oh, I'm too busy to do this, you know, publicist, write this statement or do this. Because a lot of times, I don't know about you, but a lot of times you can, especially for companies, like you can kind of hear when something is, you know, fabricated or, you know, just kind of doctored up, so to speak. It just, there's a different tone when something is thrown together or you just have this sense where you're just like, okay, who did this? Who and, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when you're talking about building a brand voice, whether you're a company or an individual person, you want your statements to feel authentic and you want them to feel the same. And I think that having a, a publicist and a communications team who is able to articulate in that way is really a game changer for your brand. And can I say one last thing? If by chance, just by chance, if there is a celebrity who is out there and who is listening to this, please, if you don't want to hire a Black publicist, please tell your publicist to stop walking past Black journalists at events, please. woo so At the end of the day, I think we have to remember that a lot of your, your favorite celebrities were Black, they got to the place that they are, like Brooke said, because of the culture. We put them there. Black journalists were, were covering them when no one else wanted to cover them. So don't forget where you started. So make sure that you're still, even when you get to the higher and higher heights, still make time for the Black journalists who are at the further end of the event or on the further end of the red carpet. Mm, that's a good point. So actually, let's talk about that for a second. Where do you think it's even come from that black media outlets are less than mainstream media outlets? Well, first of all, black people, black publications, we are the mainstream. Like if you look at trends, if you look at fashion magazines, a lot of these brands get their ideas, they get their stories from black culture. And so I don't even know where the concept of, you know, non-black being mainstream came from. Like if you go on Twitter right now, you go on Instagram, the things that are trending is probably because someone black started it. And that's not to make things about race, but it's just being honest about the algorithm. You know, there's a reason why they call black Twitter, black Twitter. There's a, you know, there's a reason for these things. And I think that people forget that sometimes. Um, but in terms of the black media being lesser than, I think for years, for centuries, for decades, 
we as black people, we've supported, you know, our black publications, whether that's Ebony, whether that's Essence, Jet, you know, now we have Refinery29, we have, you know, um, XO Nicole, and just a, a, a list of other black publications. And I think that just over the years, you know, especially for celebrities, it's almost as if Hollywood or the entertainment industry as a whole has brainwashed them to think, well, if it's not, you know, a mainstream publication like Harper's Bazaar or Entertainment Today or, you, you know, the list of the top ones, then like they don't matter anymore. And I don't know where it comes from, but I do believe that if, you know, these celebrities become more conscious of like, no, we want to blow these publications up just as much as we blow up these other ones, then I think that narrative can truly shift because think about it, right before um, the coronavirus, maybe it was like the end of last year, I wish I had the exact number, but there were like 15 top magazines and all 15 of them had a black woman on the cover. And they were saying that that was the first time that's ever happened, but it's also happened very intentionally because these publications knew that the highest consumer of print magazines were black women. And so they're saying, okay, if this is our consumer who's buying the magazines during a time where no one is really buying magazines like that anymore, maybe we need to reflect our consumers more. And like, if you go back and you look at the numbers, because there was actually someone who produced the numbers, those 15 magazines had their highest selling months simply because they put black women on the cover for the first time. And that's wow. not an accident. And so again, I think it's about changing the narrative. And I think that even as, you know, some of these, you know, top magazines, especially as they grow or media outlets grow, you start to see that they're now starting to hire more and more black writers, more and more black reporters, um, more and more black producers. And that, again, that's for a reason. I think that if, if we really look at the trend and we really see it, the moves that some of these publications or networks are making, then we'll see like, hey, if they're paying attention to black people and about, you know, and what black people like, why can't we give that same energy to these black publications out there? Wow. I think that's, that's awesome, Stephanie. And I wanted to add to, have you guys ever noticed that sometimes some of these celebrities, um, like take, for example, like Gabrielle Union and Dwayne Wade, they will um, give exclusive interviews to only um, black journalists or black publications. Yeah. So I think that's another way of how their, you know, my voice matters, my story matters, who I give an exclusive interview um, to, to share my story um, with. And Kevin Hart does that too. Like, in fact, like, so Kevin Hart does, or last year, he, I don't know if he still does, had a white publicist. But literally what he would do on red carpet, if you if he walked past a black journalist and a black journalist had a question, he'd be like, oh no, we're going back to them. And he would be intentional in making sure that they turn around. And like, I've admired that about him because bro, if you remember when we were in college, Kevin Hart was at our comedy show every single year. So yeah. again, like we were a part of him getting to where he is today. And I respect the fact that he still paid homage to that by making sure, like you said, he gives the exclusives to those black publications, even if, you know, his non-black publicist doesn't even know who we are. And I wonder, too, if it's even kind of a numbers game, only because, I mean, unfortunately, a lot of black media outlets tend to have primarily black audiences, and it's, it's not as much crossover so to speak whereas a what's considered a main also just I'll just say a non-black specific right. publication you know they're getting audience from so you know from so many other groups on a regular basis that just from a numbers perspective it's like okay if I can only talk to three people I want to make sure that my brand is getting out in front of the biggest number of people possible and so I may skip this black media outlet over here because they're great, but their audience is only a thousand people. So do you think that is, that's part of it too? No. <laughs> Another, yeah. Oh. Oh, so you're saying, you're, I want to see why Stephanie says no. Mm -mm. I, and the only reason why I say no is because oftentimes those extremely small publications, they're not going to make it to the event or the red carpet anyway. So well, that's true. Get, they're not even going to get that close to, uh, you know, a Kevin Hart or a Gabrielle Union. Um, but I will say that I think that 
it's an unintentional bias. I think that it depends on the publicist, right? So like if the publicist is not a consumer of, you know, say an XO Nicole or of an Ebony or an Essence or, you know, or, or any urban publication, they're not even going to know who we are. So to them, it's like, you don't even matter to me. You know what I mean? Because they don't see you because they don't even know who you are. They don't interact. Just the same way that a Black publicist also may not know who a Harbazari is because, again, like, it's not something that I read every single day. So I think it just depends on your publicist. Um, maybe for some people it could be a numbers game, but if we're completely honest, if we went back and asked that publicist, well, how many people are reading No, that's true. That that's one? true. They could that's true. Yeah, and I, I wasn't speaking about they a red carpet situation because I know there's only a certain, you know, right, type yeah. of of media that does get invited to that. But I was just thinking, you know, more in general, if if the numbers play play into it. But I, I think you make a, a good point on that. I think it's name, more, maybe more than numbers, maybe it's name recognition, you know? Like I might know uh, a People magazine over, you know, like you said, like a little small publication right. over here. Um, even a large publication that's still, you know, primarily African-American, Again, if I don't know the name, then I'm not right. going to care as much. True. So what would you say are, if we had to summarize, I guess the top, maybe the top three skills that publicists need to be focusing on right now, what would you say those are? I would say the top three um, that just comes to the top of my head is, um, Definitely, um, I'm key on relationship building, um, continue to build um, those relationships, continue to check in with um, contacts that you might have and to add value to them, but not just look to what you can get um, from journalists, but how you can add value to them. Um, the second one is have empathy. You know, clients um, that we're working with, they're business owners too and show empathy to them, to their businesses um, of how, um, of what they're going through. And third, um, we must pivot. Um, if there's a new strategy, um, if there's a new communication channel, um, social media is always um, evolving every day, something new on social media. Um, is coming out. So just keeping those skills up and pivoting in our um, business. Staff, what are your three? I have three. I could sign with Brooke. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> she nailed it. She nailed it. I, I agree with all three of those things. So make sure you go back, rewind, take, and, and, and follow those three things. <laughs> Hilarious. Hilarious. <laughs> so you said, you said relationship building what was your second one brooke um, you said having, relationship building um having value empathy. oh empathy empathy yeah relationship building empathy and pivot yeah yes those were yours you always have those good these good three <laughs> things i feel like you did that the last episode too and i said oh i want to steal that so let's see so let me let me try to add to add to that so adding to your three I would say my three are be relevant, be strategic, and be creative. So relevant, figuring out how you can authentically insert your client into the news cycle, and then also being relevant yourself to educating yourself on your industry and on your client and what trends are going on in the industry so that you know what things make sense to pitch right now. And then strategic, knowing which media outlets are best and which PR strategies are best. Because stuff like you said at the beginning of this episode, it's not always about being so media heavy all the time. You have to know when is the best time to go that route and the best time to look for other outlets and other ways to to get your client featured and, and shown. And then third, I would say being creative. And that ties, Brooke, into your point about pivoting because we are, there are always different ways and new ways to increase your visibility. You just have to think about ways that, you know, even if you do something on your own and put it out through your own social media channel, your website, your blog, 
your whatever it is, there are definitely always ways to, um, to increase your visibility. So thank you ladies so much for joining me for another episode of Boss Moves and PR. So before we close out, um, can you all let the audience know where to find you? You can find me on, I was gonna say all social media platforms, but I'm not on Facebook. Um, <laughs> find me on Instagram and Twitter at Steph Arcado. If you are looking for a job or a new freelance opportunity, you can find us at Black Girl Group LLC. Excellent. Brooke, how about you? Um, you can find me on social media at Brooke Bold Media. Um, and on my personal channel is um, Brooke Motivates, where I share inspirational um, tips and quotes um, to um, inspire and motivate. Excellent. And I am Samantha McCoy. You can follow me on Instagram at S McCoy Joy. So that's S M C C O Y Joy. And my business website is missionkeycommunications.com. So if you are in search of a publicist, definitely feel free to visit our pages. And if you need any help with strategy or what you should be doing right now, we would love to help you and support you. So thank you all for joining us. Until our next episode, take care.